<laughs> so, Valentine's Day is coming up. Uh, what are you getting your wife? Nothing. I don't think it works that way. Nothing? Nothing. 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 Diabolical. Yep, this year for Valentine's Day, I'm the present. Oh, can I please be here when you tell her that? Look, as if our wedding vows weren't enough, through the years, I power washed the deck, I YouTubed how to build a walk-in closet, I even changed the toilet paper roll. Sometimes without even being asked. I took her to Graceland twice. But Graceland isn't a two-trip kind of place. And do you know where she has her weekly women's Bible study every Monday night? Do I want to know? Right over there, in front of my 70-inch crystal clear true tone LED while I sit in the back room watching Monday Night Football on my kid's cracked iPad. You saint. So, this year, no presents, just presents. What'd you just say? I'm not getting her any presents. I'm giving her presents. So, let me get this straight. For Valentine's Day, you're not getting her any presents with a T. You're giving her your presents with, with, with a C. That's what I said. Presents, not presents. Diabolical. Hey, honey. Yeah? As you can imagine, Valentine's Day did not go well for Jerry this year. Don't be a Jerry. Make those you love feel special. Well, good morning and happy Valentine's Day to you and your family. I hope that you are wrapped up in a warm blanket because it's going to get cold this week and that you are sitting close to somebody that you love on this Valentine's Day Sunday. So just one uh, bit of information for you before we begin this morning. Uh, we actually kick off the Lent season on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. We're going to have two opportunities for you to join us for Ash Wednesday service at noon and at 7 p.m. So we're going to show those live. Uh, they'll be on our Facebook and our YouTube uh, channels. So you can join us for that service uh, at those times. And we'll put out a little bit more information uh, just so you have an idea of, you know, what might be required of you during those services. And just as a reminder of the times uh, that they're going to go out. So it is crazy to think about that we're starting Lent uh, and that Easter is really only about six weeks away. Um, but what a cool time to be able to celebrate uh, this season as we're just coming off the throes of 2020. Uh, and it's a, an opportunity for us to reflect and kind of remember things. So uh, this will be a good opportunity. And we're going to start a new series next Sunday, a Lent series, uh, as we do that. So that's really it. Just about the Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday at 12 o'clock or 7 p.m. And uh, so you're welcome to join us for those. And if you are ready to start this morning, uh, I am more than ready. Uh, so grab your coffee, grab your breakfast and a blanket and a nice uh, comfy seat in your house. And here we go. What if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better? Well, good morning again and happy Valentine's Day. Just one more time. I figured the least I can do is offer you those uh, Valentine's Day words since I can't high five you or hug you through the screen. 
So I made a mistake last week. I should have extended our mindset series one more Sunday because we actually begin a new series next Sunday because Lent begins. So we're going to start our Lent series next week. So I had the choice to whether uh, to decide whether or not to extend it one more week uh, when in reality I, I ended it pretty well last week. So I didn't want to add another week. So I thought, you know what? It is Valentine's Day. So why don't we talk about love? Uh, it's a great day to do that. It's you know, I, I can get away with it on Valentine's Day. It doesn't have to be part of a series. So this morning we are going to talk about love. You know, it's just a, it's a small four letter word, but yet it is probably one of the most powerful and important words that we will ever use. I mean, think about it. We have books written about love. We have movies based on love. Uh, the Hallmark Channel has made a fortune on love and there are songs about love. There are a ton of songs about love. In fact, I want to play just a really quick game that if you're watching on our YouTube or our Facebook page, you can actually join this game uh, by commenting in the chat. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to sing a lyric for you and I want you to either type the rest of the lyric uh, in the chat or you can even name the song. So it doesn't matter. And I'll pause just for a few seconds so that everybody can get their answers in. All right. Sound good? All right. You've lost that got to finish it or give me the song name. All right, that's the first one. I want to know what. There you go. Wise men say only fools rush in. All right, there was that one. When a man. All right, I got two more. Can you feel the all right, last one. Jesus. All right, so that was my game. Hopefully uh, you all got the songs or at least got the rest of the lyrics for those songs. Um, I figure we can't you know, really play a game, so we might as well have some fun at least while we're talking about love. So we sing a lot about love, just like we did this morning, but we also say love a lot. I mean, have you ever thought about how many times you declare your love for something every day? I mean... We love coffee. Some of us like tea or love tea. We love the giggles of little kids. If you saw uh, the video we posted earlier this week, that little kid was giggling uh, so much. Uh, we love art, rainbows, gardening, massages, chocolate, mountains, dogs, cats, the sun rising, the sun setting, walking barefoot on the beach, the beauty of the quiet moments of our life, books, music. I mean, this list could go on and on and on. So needless to say, you and I, we love a lot. And yet loving one another is sometimes one of the hardest things to do in life. Because the reality is that loving coffee and loving people, I mean, they are two totally different types of love. Because trust me, I would rather love my coffee more than some people that have come into my life any day. Maybe you have people in your life that are a little difficult. In fact, you're probably thinking of about at least three people who just aren't willing to admit it. It's okay, I, I am too. But let's be honest, there are some people in our lives that are just difficult to love. They are challenging, they push our buttons all the time. They, they kind of bump up against our morals and our ethical values. They question uh our actions and motives. They aren't always nice. In fact, sometimes they are downright mean. And these individuals are hard to like, let alone love. Are you with me? And yet, you and I, those of us who choose to follow Jesus, you and I, we're not you know, really called to love coffee and ice cream, although I would love it if that was the case. But you and I are called to love one another. And this call to love one another begins with Jesus. He tells us in John 13, verse 34 and 35, he said, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I mean, that's like a holy ouch verse because not only are we to love one another as Jesus has loved us but others will know that we are disciples that we are followers of Jesus by how 
we love each other. And I don't know about you, but there are days that I'm a pretty lousy follower. I'm a pretty lousy disciple and a bad example because my, my loving one another meter uh, is like sometimes operating in like the negative. There are days that I am challenging and I am difficult and yet Jesus still loves me and still calls me to do the same for other people. And one of the things that I enjoy most about Jesus is the way in which he demonstrates not only what loving one another looks like, but who the one another is that we are supposed to love. Jesus often told stories and parables to get his point across to uh, the disciples, just the crowds, and really the Pharisees and other religious leaders. And one of those stories that he told was the parable of the prodigal son, or maybe you know it as the parable of the lost son. Now, I got to admit, this isn't the typical uh, love story that most of us think about when we think about stories in the Bible. But when we look at this story close enough, we will see that the love Jesus talks about or, or the essence of the story that Jesus talks about is the love that you and I are called to have towards one another. Because this type of love is exactly the love that God expresses towards us. So this is one of many stories that uh, isn't found in any other gospel. In fact, uh, all three of the uh, lost uh, parables and stories that Jesus tells in chapter 15 are only found in the gospel of Luke. So uh, chapter 15, it, it begins by Jesus uh, talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, as well as the tax collectors and the sinners. And he's telling them different stories. And he begins by speaking of a shepherd who leaves his 99 sheep and goes and searches for the one that is lost. And then in the next story, he tells about a woman uh, with 10 coins who loses one. And she absolutely searches her house until she finds it. And finally, we come to the story for this morning. He tells the story of a father with two sons. One leaves home and the other stays. And we see what the father is willing to do when this lost son comes back home. So we're going to begin this morning in Luke 15, cha or, uh, chapter 15. There we go. Verses 11 and 12, that's where we're going to start. So Luke says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So first we hear of the younger son. He goes to the father and he practically demands his portion of the inheritance, you know, the share of his estate. And he is uh, allotted one third of the estate. The other two thirds go to his older brother. And this demanding uh, at this point was something that wasn't done back then. To ask for an inheritance while the father was still alive was one of the greatest insults that a son could show to his father. There is no law among the Jewish culture that entitles a son to a share of the father's wealth while the father is still living. So this younger son basically implies to the father that you are dead to me and I want my inheritance now. And surprisingly, we read that the father granted the younger son's request by giving him a share of the estate. Now, again, this isn't a typical response uh, that one would expect from such demands. I mean, the typical or even respected expected reaction is that the father would just absolutely explode in anger upon the request uh, and discipline his son for the cruel implications of his demands. So the son at this point, he severs any relationship that he has with his father when he asks for his share of the inheritance. Now, our day and age and our culture, it, it doesn't really afford us the severity of this image of a child asking for their inheritance early. But I'm sure those who have had children can think of a few instances when uh, their demands may have felt as if they were asking for the impossible. Or maybe there uh, are some that have had to let their children go, knowing the choice was the, wasn't the uh, was the greatest decision their child has ever made. You know, it's definitely hard letting our kids make their own decisions, especially when we know the ones that they're making will probably turn out not so good. You know what I mean? But the father lets his son go. Even though he didn't agree with his decision, even though he knew this decision put any relationship with his son at risk, the father lets him go. 
verses 13 through 16. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods of the, that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So the son has left. He's gathered up everything he has, his share of the inheritance, and he makes sure that he leaves nothing left at home so he doesn't have to go back. And he sets off for this new life filled with new possibilities and new dreams that he had of living out on his own. And not long after he settles in where he had kind of pitched his camp, he squanders away all of his money in wild living. I will let you imagine what that would be like. And so at this point, now he has nothing left. And to make things worse, a famine hits the land and he is in need to eat or else he will surely die. So the son finds himself needing a job so that he can make money so that he can eat. And he finds a job feeding pigs. I don't know about you, but that's not a job I would want. Now, I mean, again, for you and me, this isn't ideal like, at all. But it's at least a job, right? I mean, it's not the first one I would pick, but if it was the last one on the face of the earth, I would probably pick it. But for a Jewish young man... This was the worst job someone could hold because pigs were considered the most unclean animal. And Jews did not come anywhere near a pig. So the son, the younger son, the son that said, give me my inheritance now. I am peacing out and I'm going and living on my own. This son resorts to doing the unthinkable, essentially renouncing his faith, his culture, his heritage. But he is desperate. However, even with this job, he's still not satisfied because he longs to eat what the pigs are eating. But he doesn't get anything and it remains hungry, alone, and desiring for a better life than the one he is currently living. I mean, have you ever made a decision and then realized it wasn't the best decision at all? And you kind of come to realize in this like rock bottom moment that the grass wasn't greener on the other side? And even though things looked great, fun, moral, luxurious, that life that you are now stuck in isn't what it was cracked up to be. This son is now living into the consequences of his decision to leave home. His partying and absolute carefree lifestyle have cost him. And he now finds him with nothing. And not even the pigs can give him what he needs. Verses 17 through 20. <laughs> when he came to his senses... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. So I love the opening of this verse. Because Luke said he came to his senses. When the younger son realized that he made a mistake, when the kind of the light bulb moment went off, when it dawned on him that things weren't going to get much worse, it was at this moment he realized that this life that he thought was so great, that he needed so much, had actually ended up being the complete opposite of what he imagined. The son knew he had made a huge mistake. And he was beginning to recognize that things needed to change in his life. And that, you know what, he thought, if the hired hands at my father's place get, get food, then, then that's what I'll be. Because it is better. <laughs> it's better than where I am now. So he decides to make the long journey home. And all the while, you know, maybe he rehearses what he's going to say to his father. You know, dad, I screwed up bad. I did something pretty awful and, and I'm not exactly proud of it at all. I, I wasted all the money. I, I don't even think that I'm worthy to be considered your son. Please, all I want to be is a hired hand on your farm. And, and I've really often wondered what went through his mind on his way home. You know, I, I don't, we don't know how far away from home he was, but uh, I mean, it was probably pretty far. So what, what went through his mind? Did he rehearse that 
you know, that mantra of, you know, dad, I'm sorry I screwed up. This is what happened. You know, did he think twice about his decision to return home, knowing full well that he would be disgraced within his village and family? Or was he just so desperate, mentally, emotionally, and physically empty that he knew this was what had to be done? I mean, have you ever been in a similar situation? A situation where you knew you messed up? A situation where you didn't exactly make the best choice? A situation where you threw all caution uh, to the wind and just did what you wanted to do anyway? A situation that, in the end, com caused you completely to humble yourself before someone else because of how you behaved and acted or because of something that you said? Yeah, me too, right? And it is not something that I want to choose to do uh, every day, nor really ever again. And so as the younger son gets closer to home, he prepares himself for what he will experience and what the reaction of his father will be. Verse 20 to 24. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So again, while the sun was still a long way off, maybe he was at the end of the, the road and the, the father saw him coming and is filled with compassion, not anger, but compassion. And he runs to his son. Now, once again, the father acts in a way that is not within the cultural norms. Because back then, a father waited to be addressed. He didn't go running. But this father is so full of joy, elation, and excitement to see his youngest child that he runs to him, wraps his arms around him, kisses him on the cheek, which is a sign of acceptance, reconciliation, and forgiveness. And the younger son at this point starts his apology. You know, I have sinned against you in heaven. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And before he can even finish, the father screams to his servants, Bring out the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. The father says to his son, you are my son. You are not a servant. You are not a hired hand. You are my son. I love you. And I am so glad that you are home. For you were lost and have been found. And so the rest of the story kind of uh, concludes with the older brother who has been with the father this whole time. And he's getting frustrated and angry that this brother of his, the brother who left the family, who squandered money, who did some questionable things and basically disowned his father, is now treated like royalty upon coming home. I mean, why does he deserve this? You know, the older brother says, Father, I have been with you this whole time and never once did I receive any gifts like this. Why him? Why now? And the father responds this way. He said, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So we're going to look at two aspects of the story this morning as we conclude. So the first aspect of it is you and I need to recognize at some point that we have been the younger son. I mean, we might not have made such a drastic decision as the younger son did, but uh, perhaps we have, you know, done things that, that weren't right, or we have said things that we wish we could take back. You know, lies have seemed to escape our lips rather than truth. You know, we've been places we probably shouldn't have been, our circumstances that surrounded our actions and our behaviors have, in essence, put us in the same mud slop that this younger son was in. 
And maybe in those moments, we too were lost, alone, and feeling worthless and without value, crying out for help. And maybe you have been in those moments where you have felt unloved and not worthy, thinking after everything I have done, everything in my past, who would want me? Who could ever love me? Why would God ever forgive me? And for anyone, this place is really, really lonely. Yet it is often in these moments, in this rock bottom moment, that we begin to hear the whispers of come home. But because we have been beaten down by the world, told we are nothing, told we are useless, unwanted, bruised, damaged, and unworthy, we don't yet realize that there is nothing that we could ever do. There is nothing we could ever do to make God love us any less. We can't hear those words because we are still so ashamed of our choices that we begin to explain and and reason why we are coming back home. We begin to kind of bargain our chips in exchange for that start over. Yet in this moment, God looks at us straight in the eyes, holding our face with his hands. He says to us, I love you. And there is nothing you can do to change that. He says, I will love you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I will take you back again and again and again. You see, God doesn't hold things against us. God isn't going to bring up poor choices or circumstances 10 years later. God isn't going to put a tally mark on our life list of things that we have done wrong. God will never deem us, never deem us unworthy and without value, no matter what happens in life. God will never, ever deem us unworthy and unvalued. He is like the father in this story, who when we start running home, he runs to us first and meets us and wraps his arms around us and says, I am so glad you are here for you are mine. And there's nothing you can do about it. You see, God is forgiving and filled with compassion and unconditional love, never ending grace and endless mercy. When we come seeking that forgiveness and that compassion in return. So second, we need to recognize that you and I, we are called to have the same love and grace as the father did in the story. And I get it. We've already talked about it. There are some times that people are hard to love. I am right in that category. You know, but when Jesus said love one another, I believe he meant everybody, not just the people we choose and that we like. And so this parable prompts us to extend love and grace to one another. It prompts us to reach across the aisle with words of compassion. It prompts us to forgive. Why? Because grace and love have been extended to us. Compassion has been shown to us and forgiveness has been given to us. And we are to love because God first loved us. Is this easy? Nope. But neither are a lot of things. And yet we still do them, don't we? And even though this isn't easy, you and I can do hard things. And I'm going to keep saying that phrase until we start living into it and believing it. And it's just a pretty good reminder. You see, Jesus told this parable. He told the one with the sheep, the one with the lost, the woman with the lost coin to help the religious leaders see that no one is too far outside the bounds of God's love. No one is too lost that they are not worth being searched for. No one can out sin. The grace that Jesus offers. No one can out sin the grace that Jesus offers because all are welcomed, all are loved, all are worthy, all are beautiful, and all people, all people are offered forgiveness and redemption, period. Now, I know that's a really hard pill to swallow because I know there are some pretty not nice people in this world. I get it. But Jesus tells us 
All people are welcome. All people are loved. All people are worthy. All people are beautiful and sacred. And all people are offered forgiveness and grace. So not only did Jesus want, or sorry, Jesus not only wanted the outcasts and rejected members of society to hear that they were loved, worthy, beautiful, and forgiven, but Jesus wanted us to understand that we are called to offer these things to others because that is what it means to love one another. So today it's Valentine's Day. So I want you to hear the words that you are loved, you are worthy, you are beautiful, and you are forgiven because, because God's love for you is overwhelming and never ending. All right, I'm going to say that again because I'm looking at, I'm going to look right at you this time. It's Valentine's Day and you are loved. You are valued so highly. You are beautiful. You are sacred. You are forgiven because God's love is overwhelming and never ending for you. And finally, I want you to do something for me. Are you ready? I want you to tell someone today those same words. I want you to tell someone that they are loved, they are worthy, they are beautiful, and they are forgiven. Because you would be surprised at how many people never, ever hear the words. So tell them, you, my friend, are loved deeply. You are worthy beyond measure. You have a soul that is beautiful. And you, my friend, are forgiven and redeemed. All right, you think you can do that? I mean, you can, you can text it to somebody, you can message somebody, you can call somebody, you can grab the person uh, sitting beside you, look them, grab them in the face and look at them and just say these words, you know, whatever you want to do. Post it on, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I don't care. Tell somebody that you, that they are loved, they are worthy, they are beautiful, and they are forgiven. Amen. And amen and happy Valentine's Day to you all. Let's pray. God, we thank you for a day when we get to celebrate love because you, above anybody in this world and in this life, have shown us what love is. And it's not easy to love one another, but we know that your love for us is probably not easy either. And we thank you for loving us when we have been the most unlovable in our life. Lord, help us, help us to see each other as you see us. Help us to see each other as you see the world. Help us to love one another. Help us to see the value and the worth that all people hold. Help us to see the beauty in people. And Father, help us to forgive where forgiving is necessary. And even though it may take a while, help us to forgive. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for never giving up on us. We thank you that you are a holy and awesome God who accepts us just as we are with no strings attached. It is in your holy and awesome name that all of God's people say, amen.
Wednesday is this Wednesday at either noon or seven. So you have two opportunities to join us and uh, we kick off the Easter Lenten season. So that'll be super exciting. And we start a new series. We start our Lent series next Sunday as we uh, get ready for Easter, which again is crazy to think about. So, but until then, may you go in the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love one another with everything we got. Go in peace. Be safe this week with all the snow coming. And I will see you right here next Sunday at 11 a.m. Amen and amen. Have a great week. Bye.